Batman does not kill. It's like the golden rule of the character. He may break the hundred and so bones of some henchman's body in the Arkham games, but that's the code that Bruce tries to follow. And I know what you're thinking. So, this analog horror is just a what if Batman was allowed to kill? And you're partially right. But it also explores the mere horror that Batman steals on criminals and those who end up in the other side of justice. The author of this series is Siltrix, as always, I'll leave his channel in the description down below. And without further ado, let's see what he has for us in store this time. The first part takes place in 1959, 20 years after the death of the Wayne family. One night, the Occam Asylum entered in lockdown, when a mysterious figure appeared on the roof. All staff were notified of the anomaly, and the police department was called in to handle the situation. The staff were asked to maintain standard procedures and to keep an eye on four patients in particular, which in simple terms were Killer Croc, Manbat, Poison Ivy, and a so-called Patient Zero, who, we are told, is the Joker who, judging by his real name, I'm pretty sure that he is based on the Telltale Games iteration of the character. They are warned that, in case of seeing anything suspicious or if they were to come into contact with a man dressed in a bad suit, to stay away from him. Regardless, the intruder manages to infiltrate the facility. He was reported to be mumbling justice under his breath and had a ghastly and malnourished complexion. After hearing screams coming from the special containment cells, he was not seen again. When they found the prisoners, they were dead and badly dismembered, with their altered parts particularly mangled, like Manbat's wings being ripped apart or Poison Ivy's hair being cut. Of the four patients, only one survived. That was the Joker, of course, who was severely traumatized from the event. He kept talking about the man on the bat suit and that he was waiting for the day of his return. He also makes a drawing of what he saw. This is implying that this version of Batman is responsible for the current state of the Joker, assuming that he wasn't completely gone before this incident. In the following year, in 1960, Jim Gordon is keeping track of the Bat. His sightings only increased since his first appearance a year ago. He goes on to mention that after the incident with his parents, Bruce began to act strangely, understandably, and according to Ted Court, also known in the comics as the second Blue Beetle. He never got over the death of his parents and had some weird ideas on how to restore order in the city. The day after he told that to Commissioner Gordon, Court's building was burned to the ground with everyone inside. He comes back to Bruce. The circumstances behind his disappearance are still unknown, but Jim knew the truth. Bruce Wayne is Batman. Then his recording is suddenly hijacked by the Bat itself announcing ominously that he was vengeance and that he was coming for the criminals. Aside from the brutal assassinations, this just seems like a twisted version of the Batman, but here is where his methods go completely unhinged. And as a side note, you'll notice that in this version, Alfred is not mentioned anywhere. Keep that on mind. In the same year, the Gotham Police Department issued a PSA about what to do in case of a person going missing especially children. It's implied that Batman was kidnapping children. Later, in the same year, we found another recording of someone who's definitely dead by now, claiming to have evidence of Wayne being the Bat. He also connects the disappearance of Bruce Wayne from the public eye to the Arkham incident. By this point, the last recorded sighting of Batman was with a missing child, last seen near an alley. The good side is that crime in the city had almost disappeared and Arkham Asylum is practically empty. The person recording the tape finally shows the evidence, which is an almost intelligible voice recording where Bruce confessed being Batman and that his plan worked, meaning that there is something more to this demented Dark Knight. On 1962, the police issues a list of missing persons. Among those names are Dick Grayson, Barbara Gordon, Stephanie Brown, and Jason Todd. The footage is again interrupted with the words, you are too late, and shows a group of coffins lying inside a cave. And for a single frame, we see the words, they are all a family now. In that same year, the Wayne Manor was destroyed in a fire and only an old clock survived. Someone went in to investigate Behind the antiquity, he found an entrance to a vast cavern. There, he found the bat suits. 
in addition to a huge number of files with all kinds of information about Gotham and a list of people. Some of those were reported missing some days ago, but he also found his own name on the list. Also, most of the names you see here are Batman allies and variations of the character in the comics. Eventually, the person recording finds them. Or more like, he stumbles upon them. The Bat family. And even catches a glimpse of the Batman himself. But, strangely, he let him go. Leaving him confused and terrified. The police tries to cover up the incident, since one of the missing person was Commissioner Gordon's daughter. The department even confirms the vigilante's death in the fire, although they shouldn't have done so, since the crime in the city had only risen up. The person recording the tape also says that he'll try to leave Gotham as soon as possible. He didn't want to end up like one of them. We also see a missing person poster of Timothy Drake, revealing that the person who saw Batman face to face and went down the Batcave was the third Robin. And thanks to the poster, it is very clear that he failed to escape. In that same year, Jason Todd reappears, who in the comics is the second Robin, and tries to explain what happened to the missing people and his experience with the bat. He lived in a bad part of the city, and he was forced to steal car parts from a young age to survive. In one night, it's implied that he tried to unscrew some pieces of what appears to be the Batmobile. He was knocked out of nowhere and was taken to another place. There, he met the other victims of the Bat, people that he had kidnapped, among whom was Dick Grayson, the first Robin, and also Catwoman. He found out that this Batman used a modified variant of the Venom drug, which in the comics is the super steroid used by Bane. When his turn finally came, he was tied to a chair. Before starting the procedure, the Batman tells him about his life and about a butler named Alfred. He was like a father figure for him, until a couple of days after his parents' funeral, he suffered a stroke, then goes to ask him if he had a family, and when Jason answers that his parents also left him, the Batman freezes for a moment, and makes him the offer to join him in his crusade, to get rid of crime in Gotham. Of course, he refuses, and in response, Batman releases the fear toxin the same formula used by Scarecrow. In that moment, his restraints loosened, giving him a window to escape. He used a bat rank to cut off his ties and went for the exit. He felt he was being haunted by the bat, but when he looked back, he was very different. These were the effects of the fear toxin for sure. As he was nearing the exit, he felt a rumble and the bat stopped chasing him. He managed to get away from the place, and the next thing he heard was an explosion. The Wayne Manor was engulfed in flames. The police arrived shortly after, and Jason, still under the effects of the fear toxin, was interrogated, and he was able to draw a picture of Batman. Who might have guessed? The fear toxin also gives you some artistic dotes. Overall, this looks like a sick and twisted version of Batman's universe. It's not like something like that hasn't been explored before, but the presentation is what makes it special. Well, what do we have so far? The main difference here is, after his parents' death, Bruce Wayne grew up without an Alfred, and he managed to use some compounds belonging to some villains like Bane and Scarecrow to become a very twisted version of the Bat. He also kidnaps exceptional individuals, especially kids and teenagers from the streets of Gotham, to turn them into his own version of the Bat family. There is also the implication of vampirism here for the coffins and such, but that might as well be an aesthetic decision, who knows. In 1963, a Coca-Cola commercial was hijacked by the Owl Society, claiming themselves as responsible behind the incident at Wayne's Manor. This did more harm than good because crime was back on the rise, and one of the patients that Batman left alive, for some reason, that being the Joker, and I've already counted for 30 murders last year alone. His victims were marked with a smile on their faces, and their bodies were stabbed by something related to the Batman. The police suspected that he was somehow related to the Wayne's murders so many years ago, and he was also responsible of an attack with a bottle of acid thrown at the mayor implying that in this universe, Harvey Dent, or Two Faces, was the mayor of Gotham. Most people believe that the commercial hijacked by the Owls was just a hoax, an urban legend made to make people believe that Batman was dead. 
At least there hasn't been more missing children, just a bunch of lunatics on the streets, hinting at the existence of a Riddler as well. The person recording this message is Commissioner Gordon. He was preparing to leave the city for good. After the death of his daughter, there was nothing tying him down to this place, but one thing was for sure, Batman wasn't dead, and he was watching everyone in the city now. At last, in 1964, we have a message from one of Batman's victims, one of the people who appeared on that list Team Drake found, so why don't we take a listen to what he has to say. I don't know who's gonna see this. I don't know what to do anymore. There's no escaping it seems. And if I try to go anywhere else, another freak is gonna try to get me. I was thinking of moving back to Switzerland. But then, the Order will try and turn me into their Hasrael. I still go by that name, I just don't follow the order anymore. Even though most people believe that the bat is back, crime hasn't gone away, unlike when he first came. His latest work was of the big butcher. It seemed he replicated an old Norse ritual. After breaking out, I haven't seen the bat, but I've seen glimpses of the missing people sometimes. Not only are criminals being killed, but two of the missing were also found dead, seemingly killed with a cane. Duke Thomas and Elena Bertinelli. I'm at the point to just keep myself locked in my home from now on, because I'm being stuck but not only by Batman, but by Grayson. Here is a photo I managed to take of him on my roof. This was one of the many times I saw him. I saw him kill the Mad Hatter, as well as Victor Zaz. Even though the Bat and his Robins go and cause more harm than good, I don't really blame them for killing murderers but at some point crosses a line. One night, he broke into my house and attacked me. I don't know what he did, I was probably just desperate, but this was his outcome. They never caught me for doing it, they thought it was the Joker. I felt terrible about it, but I did it, in the name of God. After this incident, I fully took on the role of Azrael. So far, I have taken down two criminals, Firefly and Killer Moth. I'm going to make sure the bat stays dead, and God will let me prevail. The translated message at the end says, I do no one's biting but God's, and Mammon will fall, along with other sinners. Mammon, in demonology, is the deadly sin of greed. It seems that this Azrael guy is giving Batman the title of Sin of Greed for some reason. Azrael, in the comics, is also known as Jean Paul Valley. He was part of an ancient Templar sect named the Order of Saint Thomas. They created a champion named Azrael through intense training and psychological conditioning. He and the Batman eventually clashed with each other, but Bruce and company managed to undo the effects of the conditioning, and he became an ally of the Bat family, even going as far as moving to Gotham with them. During the event of Nightfall, when Bane broke Batman's back, someone else had to take the mantle, and it was up to Jean Paul Valley to take up the suit. From this point, he gets a little out of hand, since he didn't have the same moral code as Bruce. Here you can see the philosophy of Batman being explored, the reason behind the no-killing rule, and that Batman's companions, his Robins, act as a moral anchor so that the Dark Knight doesn't succumb entirely to his darkness. But in the end, Bruce comes back as Batman and puts an end to Azrael's rampage. Well, in this case, he follows a quite similar role. The Jump of Valley of this world mentions that he had no problem with Batman killing criminals, but even to someone like him, a Nordic sacrifice is a little excessive. He also mentions that some very twisted villains were put down, such as Professor Pig and Victor Zaz. I think that just by looking at the design of these guys is enough to understand that. Some of Bat's villains are completely irredeemable, and as much of the methods of the space Batman have proven to be effect, there are times that it's just too much. Okay, I'm sorry, if I didn't make the comparison with Conrad Kurz, I was going to explode. As I said, Paul also appeared on the names that Timothy Drake found in the Batcave, and as an another funny detail, the missing people that Azrael mentions in the comics are Huntress and Signal. Although Huntress has a more important role than Signal, as far as I know, they are also allies of Batman. With all this reference to the comics, it is clear that the author knows the source material very well, and I know that this whole thing of the analog horror has been very exploited lately. Sometimes I just see it as a 
format, a format that well executed shed some light to some rather twisted and grim details of some pieces of media. So tell me, what do you guys think? Remember to leave a like and subscribe if you like the video and if you like the type of content I'm doing. And leave a comment down below with some recommendations of whatever I can improve. That really helps me and the channel. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.